Please join me in a salute to the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting for November 6th, 2017. We'll open up with the public comment period. Anybody from the public wishing to speak, please identify yourself. And Good evening. Norman Soberdick, 70 Tide Mill Road, representing Rational Taxpayers of Hampton. I will not be making too many more uh, presentations uh, between now and the end of the year because I'll be spending a lot of time in Florida. So. Feel for me. Feel for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are four subjects that I just wanted to bring up briefly. The first one, in order to avoid conflicts between the Budget Committee and the Board of Selectmen and to have transparency, which used to be more prevalent in earlier administrations, the working budgets had always been put on the website so that anybody, as you're having a discussion with a department head, uh, the public, rational taxpayers of Hampton, the budget committee could all look at the working documents. And last year, where there was a lot of controversy, that wasn't uh, that didn't happen. And there is, we went to the website. There is a folder called for working work work papers, and when we went to it. It's an empty folder. So we would request that the board of selectmen make sure that the website has the current working documents so that everybody could benefit from your wisdom and knowledge when you're deliberating with the uh, department heads. It would make it a lot easier in the process. I think we'd go quicker. Second subject is the cable TV fund. In, in 2016, it was $29,000 in that fund when the Warren article was passed. It's now $397,000. And I know there was a meeting of the Cable TV Committee and they had some proposals. We had been up here talking to you previously and it suggested that the fees that uh, you collect from Comcast be cut in half. So basically providing a rebate to the, the, to the Cable TV subscribers who in fact the taxpayers, which would mitigate the uh, reducing this uh, uh, Four hundred thousand dollars because it would be lower fees coming to the town. Uh, I know that Mary Louise had sent you a letter suggesting a, another Warren article to reduce the percentage from 100 back to 40. And I think the cable TV uh, committee should have whatever money they need, but there's an excessive amount of money, and that should really effectively go back to the taxpayers. Um, the third item, which has been a long uh, cry in our throats has been the commercial trash that the town pays for. I think this subject needs to be, uh, it, it's an inequitable system and needs to be reviewed again very carefully. Why certain businesses are given uh, a free pass and their commercial trash is picked up as much as uh, daily and others are not and they pay their own. I, I, I haven't a clue how the whole process works. I think there ought to be an analysis of the costs of what it, what it takes for the Department of Public Works to pick up the trash and what that represents and for the town to strongly consider putting it out to, to uh, bid for someone to get the license to take over the commercial trash collection uh, either as the avoided cost that you're not going to have to pay and pay the town a fee for the right to have the license because I remember one point in time there was some concern you have all these trucks running around town well somebody paid a franchise fee to take over all these businesses and to and to uh, pay charge the businesses for a commercial business expense the town should uh, not only save the money for what it spends but also perhaps get a franchise fee the fourth item is I know that uh, Mr. Bean particularly has been trying to see if we can get more of our tax money back that we give from meals and rooms tax. And, and uh, I think like Sisyphus, it's rolling a, a boulder up a hill because those communities that are recipients of our, our tax dollars are never going to allow us to get back our fair share. However, there was previous uh, efforts made to have a, a sales tax or a meals and rooms tax 
legislation in the House that would allow communities such as Portsmouth and Hampton to charge a uh, fee for to add it to the sales tax or, or meals tax and then basically uh, uh, this bill died in, in process but I have a feeling that it's coming back to life again and I think together with Senator Ennis and and our and our uh, representative uh, group that we should be very strongly advocating for the uh, inclusion of a sales tax or, or meals uh, meals and room tax so that we can get back a little more of a fair share of our own of our own money and I think that would be an equitable system but it's uh, again a hard battle thank you for your time I wish you a happy holiday see you soon <laughs> Announcements in community. Oh, I'm sorry. Anybody else for public comment? I'm sorry. Hi, uh, Scott Reed, Gentian Road, Hampton. Uh, I want to thank everybody for getting Swamp Incorporated out to Gentian to uh, dig up the, uh, the the ditch so we can uh, drain better. Uh, as of today, we're still flooded in about five, six inches of water. Um, tides are high. A little bit of rain. Um, full moon, but. Uh, we're still needing some uh, town assistance with our issue with flooding. Our properties are suffering, and um, yeah, it's one of those things where I had an opportunity to buy a property behind Wally's once upon a time, but they said, well, it floods during the full moon. So if I didn't want to buy a property then, knowing that, um, I didn't really realize that when I bought my property on Gentian Road. So I'm hoping that uh, we can work towards a full resolution towards the problem. I know when I had flooding, when I lived out in the Illinois area back in the day, uh, the uh, government maybe put in a special uh, type of drain into my basement when it had flooded uh, in order to receive that grant. And uh, there are some things that we can do with the drainage system in order to uh, prevent some of the flooding on our street. I can literally see bubbling of water coming up through the drain when the tide goes up. So. Um, anyway, I just want to make sure that the town is aware that uh, we're still having some issues and I want to, again, thank you for the effort with Swamp Incorporated and uh, Philip Bean as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the public wishing to comment? Seeing none, we'll go to announcements and community calendar. Regina? Uh, no, no, I just want to say I was at the uh, Warriors game, first game of the state champs, and congratulations, want to count it for a uh, undefeated year so far. Okay, uh, Rusty? Yeah, Saturday, November 11th, the American Legion and the Hampton Historical Society is doing a program called Hampton Voices from World War I. Uh, 11 a.m. at the American Legion, 1 p.m. at the Lane Memorial Library. Also, I want to remind people that Christmas is coming, so is in the Christmas Parade on December 2nd. They are still looking for, uh, if you have want to have an opportunity to put a float in or something like that, uh, you need to get a hold of uh, the parade people, and I believe if you call oh, the rec department, they, they can get you the information. Also, the tree lighting is on, on December 1st. Uh, we also, uh, the there's a number of churches in town that are having their annual holiday fairs this weekend, and I want to thank everybody that was out donating food for, scouting for food for last weekend. They collected over 6,500 items from the town and that goes to support the the food pantries right here in Hampton so I know the scouts did an excellent job and I really appreciate that thank you Rick no thank you Phil yes thank you mr. chairman <clears throat> um, one of the greatest businessmen uh, in the town of Hampton uh, I like to call him uh, Richard Chevalier but it's uh, Dick Chevalier from Dearborn Ave had uh, sugar and spice he uh, has a significant birthday milestone this weekend. He is going to be at the Lodge, Mr. Welch. Uh, I believe that's Saturday um, from 12 to, uh, for several hours anyway. And he is going to be the uh, big nine zero. So uh, past that octogenarian stage and moving into the, uh, the, the better part of life. Uh, so to him and his wife June and his family, uh, Cindy Arlington and her crew, happy birthday to them. The United States Marine Corps, uh, which was founded in a tavern, Tun Tavern in Philadelphia. There's a, 
a troublesome looking Marine against the bulkhead back there. Chris Morrison, happy birthday, Marine. Uh, that is celebrated at uh, the newly designated Sun Tavern in Hampton, John Tinius' uh, Club Tinos. That will be at the second deck for Marines and invited guests. That will commence at 1630 in one of the great simple military uh, ceremonies in the, in the town of Hampton. So we thank the Tinius family, those Marines that have served. Any questions, get with Ralph Vitello, former commander of the Post Legion. And uh, he is the, uh, the person that is in charge of those events. I want to thank uh, Mr. Silberdick for coming in and shedding some light on his interpretation of uh, how this town runs. He's been a valuable, valuable uh, uh, person and uh, an, an effort in this town. And uh, there's one other thing I want to talk about, but it's slipping my mind. I'll bring it up uh, later on. Um, but that's it. It was a great football game. It's a great town. It's been a great autumn. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Consent agenda, 2018 new veterans and veteran spouse credit applications. Uh, new Hampshire DOT municipal work zone agreement repairs to the Hampton Harbor Bridge. Conservation Commission alternate appointment, Rebecca Arlen. Donation of used file cabinet for legal department, value of $300. So moved. Rusty, Regina, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Appointments, Scott E. Egan, Plotsky, and Sanderson Professional Association Auditors, 2016 Annual Financial Report Audit. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Either way, you can sit there. There's a microphone there also okay. at the table. Okay, thank you very Whatever much. Whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, good evening, everyone. Again, I'm Scott Egan with your audit firm, Plotsky and Sanderson, out of Concord, New Hampshire. Um, here to present your 2016 audit. I wanted to run over uh, your opinion, a couple of the budgetary highlights, a few points in the report, and then I would like to open it up to you to answer any questions, and customarily I know the board has had you know, several <laughs> questions, so I'll let you direct me as to the information you want to hear. Um, I do want to point your attention to page one of the audit report and just spend a few minutes going over your opinion. Um, this is a very important part of the audit here. I just want to explain a little bit about the opinion letter and what it's telling you here. Um, your first paragraph, we're just, again, letting you know what we're auditing, the accompanying financial statements of the governmental activities, each major fund, and the aggregate remaining fund of the town as of and for the year ended December 31st, 2016, and the related notes which collectively comprise this report. Um, management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of the numbers in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And our responsibility as auditors is to express an opinion on the financial statements based upon our audit, which we conducted uh, in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards, uh, in order to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. Um, this year, uh, you have received an unmodified opinion on all opinion units. That's a clean opinion or what you're looking for. Um, and I'll just read that paragraph for you. In our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material respects the respective financial position of the governmental activities, each major fund, and aggregate remaining fund information of the town of Hampton as of December 31st, 2016. Um, again, this indicates that there were no material misstatements identified in the audit and you are current with all applicable governmental accounting standards as of this time, which has allowed you to have an unmodified opinion, which is what you are really shooting for. Um, at this point, what I wanted to do was go to the back of the report and go over a little bit of the budgetary information and talk about the change in your unassigned fund balance for the year, um, just to give you a brief summary of the financial operations for the year. Um, the budgetary information, uh, the detailed budgetary information begins on page 42 of your audit reports um, and it's labeled Schedule 1 and this is the essentially budget versus actual report, uh, the budgetary results of your general fund. Uh, the total budgetary um, estimated budget was $28,621,000. Um, included in that was $1,005,000 uh, intended to reduce the tax rate. So that was a planned decrease in your fund balance. Um, you actually, um, excluding that item, 
had a, a positive uh, variance or a, a revenue surplus of nine hundred thousand um, dollars, mainly led to some additional tax revenue and increased motor vehicle revenues, uh, which allowed you uh, to end on a positive basis for your revenue. Um, Schedule two details your expenditures for the year, and um, again, if you look at the uh, end of this, most of the departmental budgets um, were fairly close given the size of your community and the overall budget, resulting um, in an unexpended balance of your appropriations of about $716,000. Um, so again, on the $28 million, that's a relatively close number um, or realistic budget that was adopted and the spending was um, in whole in line with what was budgeted. Um, on page 45, Schedule 3, this just gives you a quick summary of, of the changes in fund balance that you received of your unassigned fund balance. Uh, you began the year with $6,991,000 in unassigned fund balance. Again, we discussed that million dollars, which was uh, your part of your prior year fund balance that you reduced as a re that you used as a revenue offset to reduce the amount of taxes that you raised. Uh, you had a revenue surplus of $900,000 an unexpended balance of your appropriations of $716,000, which added back $1.6 million to your unassigned fund balance. Uh, there were some changes in your other claims on fund balance, other restrictions. There was an increase in non-spendable fund balance. Um, those are just required designations of your fund balance if you have non-spendable items, mostly usually prepaid items that are not in cash form that, that create a claim on your fund balance and an increase in uh, an assigned fund balance and an abatement for a contingency. Again, another increase in a, in a claim on that unassigned fund balance, which uh, ended you at $7,136,000 for the year. Um, again, there was a planned decrease, if you will, at all else equal, you would have decreased that number by a million dollars, but as a result of a combination of uh, a budgetary savings and a favorable revenue amount, uh, you actually increased your unassigned fund balance slightly for the year. Uh, and again, that's all in line, um, you know, within your minimum fund balance uh, that as a board you, you try and shoot for each year, and that was evaluated as part of the audit. Um, just to bring you back now, um, again, that's probably some of the, the most significant information, but I want to bring you to page nine, um, your statement in net position. This is the, the government-wide or the combining balance sheet for the town. Um, it lists all your assets and liabilities, long-term assets, capital assets, and uh, liabilities. Uh, a lot of things in here are in line with prior years. I just want to point your attention again to the long-term liabilities and just go over one point. Um, the long-term liabilities are comprised of several items, um, some of which are traditional borrowings that you may be used to. Others relate to pension liabilities, other post-employment benefits that really are amounts that are required to be reported on your financial statements, but there is a they're a result of you belonging to the New Hampshire retirement system and it's your proportionate share of the retirement system liability. And I just want to point that note out to the board um, so you can review that. And um, that'll be located um, on page 29, your long-term liability note. You'll see uh, the total long-term liability uh, is 44,846,000 of that. Uh, 23538000 relates to this net pension liability, whereas the traditional bonds payable that you have as a community would only total 19566000 So this is a variable component of your audit report each year is depending on the pension liability that results in uh, from the retirement system, that gets passed on to you and may go up or down in a given year, not because of payments. It's not a funding issue from the town. It's really just your proportionate share of, of whether or not that plan is funded or underfunded. And um, you know, this year, there was a $1.8 million increase in your net pension liability, not again due to what the town was doing, but due to some changes in actuarial assumptions, which decreased the funding percentage of the plan, which gets passed down to all the um, 
pension plan members. Um, and finally, I just wanted to go over um, your governmental funds balance sheet and activity. Um, this is going to give you a breakdown of the individual funds, um, your general fund, your permanent fund, the real estate trusts, and your other governmental funds, which are going to be highlighted um, individually in the back of your report, uh, beginning on, let's see here, I believe it's going to be page 46. Uh, but that collectively will give you the individual fund basis um, results of each uh, major fund, which again, you have two, which would be your general fund, your permanent fund, the real estate trusts, um, and then all other fund information. But um, across the board for the other funds, your real estate trust um, ended with uh, total fund balances of $20,207,000. Um, and that is going to be an increase in fund balance of about $2.3 million over last year, largely due to favorable investment performance. Um, your other governmental funds uh, ended with, again, total fund balances of one point one million one hundred thirty nine thousand uh, that was an increase in uh, fund balance of one hundred ten thousand dollars from prior year and the detail of the individual fund results will be found at the end of the audit report um, at this point I wanted to open it up to answer any questions that you may have on this report or have any other questions that you may have for me Adrena? Um yeah you pointed out on the uh, long-term liabilities that actually most of that amount is comes from the uh, net pension liability? Correct. Which up until a few years ago, we weren't even recognizing, is that correct? Exactly, there was a reporting change. It was GASB statement number 68. And essentially, prior to this accounting pronouncement, it was a cash basis accounting for your retirement where you just reported your contributions that you made to the system and there was no related liability. Um, this happened globally to all governments that they changed essentially to an accrual basis where now um, the plans always calculated whether they were funded or underfunded but in a in a group plan like you belong to in the New Hampshire retirement system um, what they determined was that that liability needs to be proportionately reported by each individual member it isn't your actual liability if you wanted to actually exit the, the retirement system it's not a hard fast number it's an actuarial estimate um, and the note related to that will show you just kind of how volatile that number can be um, in the detailed retirement note it shows you if you change the assumed rate of return on the investments one percent up or down there's going to be a significant fluctuation in that but that is something that um, came on well, two years ago now um, and has you know dramatically impacted all government financial statements um, and again the larger the community the higher uh, number of personnel you have payroll that you're paying the larger that liability is as a percentage of your your overall um, liabilities and on that note next year they're going to be doing something similar to your other post-employment benefits um, right now there is a other post-employment benefit liability which compared to this is again relatively small uh, what they're doing is they're changing <laughs> they're changing that and there is going to be a other post-employment benefit liability related to New Hampshire retirement system and the medical subsidy that is um, going to be reported it's going to be much smaller than the pension numbers when the pension numbers came out it was somewhere around 4.8 billion that they were splitting up amongst everyone in New Hampshire um, and I believe that the ballpark on the last I looked at the audit report was somewhere around 700 million is the medical subsidy percentage that again is going to be split up on a kind of pro rata share a, a contribution based share to um, each of the local government state everyone who participates in the New Hampshire retirement system but again that's going to be a much smaller number and because of changes to New Hampshire retirement and the medical subsidy program that'll be decreasing each year uh, in theory so um, those are something to be aware of that there's going to be a change to your OPEB um, that's going to be coming through and, and we'll highlight that in in next year's audit when when that change happens to give a little bit of emphasis to that but again it's another one of these uh, liabilities that is essentially passed down to you for lack of a better way to put it um, 
you're still going to have a, in addition to the medical subsidy, you still have your other OPEB piece. They're going to change the way that that number gets calculated as well. Um, and they're streamlining some of the assumptions and that, that number is going to go up. Um, nothing has changed in reality of the plans or the benefits you're providing, but the accounting standards are, are changing the way that you must account for it and uh, some of the assumptions that the actuaries are allowed to use to come up with that estimate. Um, so that'll be something coming down the line uh, for next year. But as far as your job as an auditor, your job is to come in and make sure that financial statements are properly stated. There is no over or understatement of assets or, finan or liabilities. Exactly. And that's what all these updates to recent accounting pronouncements that have exactly. been adopted and implemented by our finance director have done. Exactly. That, that these numbers are true in accordance with the current standards. So, um, you know, one year there was $23 million less on your balance sheet, but under the accounting rules, that was correct. Um, and then when that change occurred, we made sure that that was implemented correctly and that the proper balances and, and changes to the pension expense were reflected in here, as well as the notes to the financial statements that these are complete and accurate um, as of the, you know, the, the standards in force as of the financial statement date. Thank you very much. Also, thank you. That's it. So what did you say the, uh, the amount is estimated for the uh, retirement? The other post-employment, the next year's yeah. amount, the other post-employment benefits. The medical subsidy, I believe the, the total amount, um, and I haven't looked at it in a while, but I believe was around $700 million. And again, that's to be split up amongst all members yeah. of the Hampshire Retirement System. Half of that goes to the state, and then it gets proportionately shared. And um, how much for the other one, though? The uh, uh, is there another charge for the re the actual retirement or uh, the pension? Yeah, pension. the pension piece was in that note was the twenty three million. Um, that's your percentage share of the total um, net pension liability of the Hampshire retirement system. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott, for coming in. Uh, I really like the work that you've done uh, and you've transitioned with our, our finance director. And uh, um, over my six years at, uh, at this post and uh, reviewing this every year, uh, this is the tightest report I've seen. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, it, 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 there really is uh, a quantum difference in uh, the reporting, uh, the compliance, uh, in the numbers and in how it presents itself. So thank you for, for leading us in, in those uh, federal compliances under government accounting standard rules. Uh, I know that you did some of those uh, out of hide uh, for the town. Uh, our director, um, newly tenured, but a long tenured at this department, has done a magnificent job. Uh, Mr. Welch over here uh, has done a magnificent job. And in the totality, as you look at this, uh, bought it and it, it gets me really excited uh, to review this and I've got myriad questions for you uh, to orient the public to just how great it looks and to speak of some of the challenges um, it uh, it really is an extraordinary corporation of first responders it is an extraordinary corporation of uh, citizens and taxpayers uh, and uh, a really really remarkable government platform and it uh, certainly has to be one of the finest corporations if not the finest in this town uh, and, and certainly, as we look to uh, um, state governments, other governments that fail, uh, international governments that fail, um, Mr. Welch, uh, my fellow board members, and, and those that have contributed to it, to include finance and you guys, have done an exceptional job. I will say that, um, before I get into my details, uh, as you look at these uh, pension liabilities, um, there's some wiggle room in those, but those will be paid by this town. And uh, those are liabilities. Mm -hmm. And you look at the extraordinary cost to include health insurance in these pensions, and it's tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars of liabilities. And those will be paid. And there is wiggle room, and we'll discuss a little bit of that. Uh, and then when you look at this effort of the state that used to fund a portion of that, am I correct, Mr. Bridal? Absolutely. And what happened to their effort on that? Did it vanish? It dried up. It dried up. And so those that would uh, say that we uh, do not continue to, continue to clamor 
uh, and legislate and uh, uh, execute torts uh, to secure reimbursement for our substantial, substantial investment on state properties. Uh, you're not looking at this audit the right way. Um, you probably can't run a business. Uh, and if you do, you're going to be out of business because uh, these are extraordinary, extraordinary responsibilities that until the director um, incorporated these compliances and there were modified statements by you about these, these true costs weren't, weren't available. And when you do, you do put them together on top of salary, on top of health insurance costs, on top of these pension costs, it is extremely, extremely expensive to put somebody on another business platform that they don't pay for and you don't get paid back for. It's unfair to the taxpayers, and this is more dramatic uh, evidence of our need to exploit those uh, pursuits that we are, that Mr. Giraldis, this is board, has voted on, um, and uh, it is a very righteous and just economic right that we do that. So thank you for that. I had fun enjoying uh, the time that I did spend reviewing this. And again, thank you for your work. Uh, explain to the uh, folks uh, the net position in this town, please. Sure. The, uh, what, what that concept means and uh, our net position. And, sure. Uh, how good uh, that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your total net position is uh, 44894000 and that can be found on page 9 of the audit report. Uh, that's essentially the residual value. Um, after you've um, taken away all the liabilities, deferred inflows, um, other commitments, subtracted <coughs> them from your assets, it's the residual amount. Um, it help, it's helpful for a lot of people to kind of consider this your net worth. Um, it's a concept that translates for people. Um, and typically, um, there are a couple of things to, to point out in here. Uh, the largest component of your net position is the net investment of capital assets. So that's the value of all your capital assets, less any related borrowings that were used to acquire those assets. So um, your, your infrastructure, your buildings, et cetera, um, that contributes essentially or makes up 28 million uh, of your net position. Um, other restricted amounts, uh, a lot of that is your trust fund, your permanent trust fund money. Um, that's $20 million. The deficit, the unrestricted deficit of $4.1 million, that's the residual, what's left over. And again, uh, that's mainly that way because of that pension liability. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at it, this is looking at all of that. But again, that's a, essentially a unfunded liability that has come onto your books, which has decreased that. But in, in total, it shows a, a net position. Uh, a positive net position of forty-four million eight hundred ninety-four thousand. Wonderful, thank you. On page three of your report, you say it's a useful indicator of whether the financial condition of the town of Hampton is improving or deteriorating. Based on uh, your statements and our net position and your audit, uh, please comment on whether our net position uh, is improving or deteriorating. Sure, sure. And I'll, I'll just want to clarify, that is part of actually Christie's part, the management's discussion analysis, but I would concur with that statement. Um, and again, if we if we take a look at the <coughs> various components of this, um, page ten, change in net position, um, you'll see a, a positive increase of eight million six hundred eighty nine thousand dollars. That would be the number that I would look at, showing that again it's increasing. There are a lot of components that go into that number, um, but that would be um, you know the true reflection of, of the direction that the net position is heading. Thank you, um, Gatsby thirty four. Uh, the government-wide government -wide statement of net position. Yes. Um, on page four, and we'll get into some more details. I've got uh, 15 to 20 more questions for you. This is very important stuff. Um, the depreciation expense. Uh, explain that in general terms of the uh, several million dollars a year that uh, that expense line is running, and what are the implications uh, for um, preservation and reconstruction of those assets? Sure. So. Um I have to take one step back from that question just to give everyone a little bit of an explanation. Um, your audit report has three bases of accounting. You have a budgetary basis, um, which is how all your state forms are reported, and that budgetary basis is concerned with compliance with the budgets and, uh, and amounts voted for each department each year, and annual appropriations, encumbrances, uh, remaining budget balances of each line. Um, and 
again, that's kind of a budgetary spending and what you report each year to get your unassigned fund balance. There are, there's a modified accrual basis, which has some different requirements um, of what's deemed an expenditure than your budgetary basis. The budgetary basis, um, again, it has some state nuances. Um, but the bottom line on both of those is that you budget them out for um, a building, and, and the outlay for the building is, is charged against the budget in the year that it was budgeted. Um, when you look at depreciation expense and, and expenses on your government-wide statements, uh, what happens is those major buildings improvements are, are capitalized, and um, as opposed to the budgetary basis where everything is expensed in the year that the item was budgeted for and paid for, um, it's matching the expense with the portion of a, a useful life of that asset. So um, it's kind of an indication that depreciation expense of the, if you want to think a bit of the annual operating costs of your long-term assets, and that's really what that number represents and, and kind of shows you, again, there's a, a budgetary focus, but from an operational standpoint, it gives you a little bit of a different view of what's required to run the town. Thank you. And an example perhaps would be uh, uh, we have the uh, junior high school hasn't had changes in 40 or 50 years. There were just uh, a $24 million um, reconstruction project, 24, 25, whatever it was. Um, but that would be incorporated in that depreciation. The asset is actually deteriorating, and then you've got to commit resources back in to raise that capital Correct. limit back up again. And then, of course, it'll depreciate again. Correct. And then we've got that problem with our sewer system, and uh, um, that's going to be uh, something we'll talk about in a bit, but the same principle. We don't spend any money on it for 40 or 50 years, and then boom, it's time to pay up. Uh, thank you. Uh, deferred outflows on page, uh, deferred outflows of resources. In 2016, it was 6.7 million. In 2015, it was 1.4. Can you just generally speak to that 5 million, 5 point something million dollar swing? Um, that is going to mainly, um, I'd have to look at the report here, but that's going to mainly relate to changes in pension variables. Um, that's typically your deferred inflows and deferred outflows. Uh, the, the main contributors to that are changes in the pension liability. Um, those are, are essentially <coughs> increases. Um, it, it's like an, in, a deferred outflow is, it, it, it's not really an asset because it's in, it's essentially it's an increase in an asset, if you will, that relates to a future reporting period, and most of these things relate to pension amounts. Thank you. Uh, budgetary revenues, Exhibit A, um, the actual budgetary revenues exceeded the budget estimate by uh, $0.8 million. That's a good thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, you want to be on that side. Yeah, we do. Uh, page number seven, the, the, again, the net capital assets. Um, you've got land, construction and progress, buildings and improvements, machinery, equipments and vehicles, uh, infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure is at uh, 50 million. Uh, vehicles, uh, 13 million. Equipment included uh, buildings and improvements. So those are substantial uh, depreciation uh, expenses and challenges for a municipality, are they not? Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Okay. Um, our bonded debt limit. Tell me uh, what you think about that in terms of uh, statutory uh, under NH, uh, the RSA 33.4 and uh, where we're at and in terms of percentage, 20%, 26. Please uh, expound on that. Um, sure. I, I mean, I think relative um, relative to your size, uh, your you're not up against your debt limit, you're well below it. Um, and each community has varying levels of debt depending on how they uh, fund their infrastructure and the, and the size. A town like Hampton has, has a lot to maintain, um, has a lot of um, infrastructure and public improvements that need to be maintained. So relative to the services you're providing, I would say it's a, it's a reasonable amount of debt and well below your limit. Um, and the uh, allowable debt calculation is based on total valuation, is it not? Yes. Okay. And so we've got a community that is perhaps a, an upper middle class community. Uh, there's other uh, communities that don't have uh, some of these uh, economic engines and these, uh, these uh, valuations uh, that uh, border us. And so while the valuations are high, uh, the average taxpayer when they're confronted with percentages and they could increase that, it still has to be paid by someone with an, 
a pocketbook or a wallet, correct? Right. So expound on that, for, uh, for folks, please. The, yeah, I, there's I, a dichotomy there that doesn't translate well to uh, reality. Sure. I mean, I, it, you're not going to want you're you're at about twenty percent of your your bonded debt limit. But the the end result of all this is that. Uh, each year, uh, those debt payments are going to be budgeted. They're going to be a fixed part of your budget. You're going to know what they are. Uh, so when you increase your, your debt limit by $10 million, that's a real payment that needs to be paid for and budgeted each year, and you don't have any wiggle room or way to reduce it. You're going to be committed for whatever that borrowing term is, and it's going to have a noticeable impact on the tax rate. So it's managing... Um, how you do that, when is the right time to borrow, what's the right amount to borrow, um, and you know what's the right amount of surplus to set aside to reduce borrowings in the future, things like that, that all communities face. Um, and it's it's nuanced in every every community, but that's kind of the long-term capital planning that, that boards have to deal with. Got it. Thank you. And again, we, we talked about it briefly, but a, a deferred outlaws, outflows of resources, again, related to pensions. Again, the state walked away from that. Uh, page number nine, $6.6 .6 million. I don't need any comment. Uh, on page number 10, um, motor vehicle permit fees. Our, our town clerk runs that department. That is uh, a three point, uh, well, what, what is that for? Um, $3.4 million business down there. Correct. They're doing uh, $14,000 a day in revenue. Uh, they run it with four or five people. It's one of the biggest businesses in town. Your comments on uh, that, please? Uh, it's a very well-run department, um, very professional. We haven't had any issues down there. Um, and again, uh, the, the motor vehicle trends um, statewide with the economy, we've seen a lot of communities surpass their budget, but from a, a collection and control standpoint, we haven't you know, identified any issues within that office. Wonderful. Thank you for that. It, it, it is a great business. And it's a very well-run department, and it is not subject to those uh, depreciation factors, uh, huge personnel costs, and, uh, boy, it is a real force multiplier for our bottom line. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, on uh, page number 11, uh, in, in, uh, voluntary tax liens, tax deeded property subject to sale. Um, total amount of that looks to me about $100,000. Is that correct? Um, Yes, you're you're at about sixty eight, sixty nine thousand, and that is people that have not, uh, cannot, uh, and, and do not pay their their tax bills. Correct. That is correct, and um, the the reserve until collected, we don't count that as part of your fund balance since it's not really available. So that's why you have that contra amount on there. So that doesn't flow into the bottom line fund balances that you see there, but. It's accounted for and transparent there. Got it. Uh, and then further on down that, that schedule on page 11, unavailable revenue. And I know this is year-end last year. However, uh, it's $0.8 million for unavailable revenue property taxes. Mm -hmm. Just expound on that, please. Sure. Um, <coughs> your property tax revenue, um, for this statement, there is a, a revenue recognition criteria. Essentially, it's the funds must have been received within 60 days of year end to be considered revenue, and amounts that you know are yet to be will be received or will receive 60 days after year end, they are um, deferred on this statement. Just again, um, this statement has what they call a current uh, financial resources uh, focus, so they want the funds to actually have been received in cash soon enough after year-end to actually liquidate year-end bills, so it's mm -hmm. a little bit more restrictive reg revenue recognition criteria. So that is essentially tax revenue that came in March or later. Got it. And, and, and that 800000 is that a multi-year, that $0.8 million, is that a multi-year before a lien goes on? It is that what that is, or is that, um, is that within the calendar year? That's within that? the that's within the calendar year. That's of your of your revenue that we're reporting. That's the amount that came in more than sixty days after year end. Got it. And that's earning uh, twelve percent, correct? Correct. Okay, got you. Um, uh, the unassigned fund balance uh, speaks for itself. I think that's an extraordinary uh, job by uh, leadership in this town, by the taxpayers, by the citizens, and Mr. Welch and finance. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, the capital assets, you've got a schedule varying on whether it's land or property or equipment. You've got a schedule for depreciation. Uh, on page 12, you're talking uh, we're starting out at $97 million, uh, for your assessment of those and that it's dropped uh, down to 50 uh, just under $50 million, correct? Correct. This is one of the, the schedules here that you're looking at on page 12. Um, because there's three different 
rules essentially that we're preparing the statements with, each of them has a reconciliation to yes, the sir. other. And you're correct in that, that 97 million, that's your historical cost, the purchase price of essentially mm -hmm. those assets. And the accumulated depreciation of almost 50 million brings the, the net value down to 48 million. Got it. Uh, Long-term liabilities, again, we've got the bonds uh, that we do uh, for, for our capital and our infrastructure. And, and importantly, again, I say um, our net pension liability uh, exceeds, uh, and there is wiggle room, but I, I would say that it still exceeds our uh, bonded uh, um, obligations. Um, and uh, certainly it's, it's, it's no less. There isn't a 20, 25% wiggle room in that, and it's $23 million. And again, that's the cost of, of government, and it's extraordinary. And under general government in our expenditures, uh, which is $8.6 million, uh, a substantial portion of that, millions and millions of dollars, is our health insurance. So that's, uh, that's quite a bit. Um, in terms of uncompensated um, uh, fund uh, uh, fund balance or un un uncompensated lead balance, mm -hmm. it's about a million bucks. Is that correct? Uh, 1.3. 1.3 million. Is there a better way to do that? I know we all, we look at like a quarter million. You know, you get a feel for who's going to leave and who's going to stay. Uh, yeah. Is there a better way to manage that, or is this how other towns do it? I would say you're pretty typical. Um, what you need to make sure you're doing, and generally most communities do this within their personnel policies is there's a notification window which would allow the finance office and give them notification that these people are retiring and we're going to have to liquidate these liabilities and it allows them time to work that into the budget and that current portion um, either there's a, a standing target that you're budgeting each year or it's based upon a known amount because to receive your payment you need to notify us of your intention to retire by this date mm -hmm. um, as far as what Hampton's doing, I would say, you are beginning to fund the liability. Uh, a lot of communities have not. Um, this is a liability you can fund through an expendable trust fund, which the town has started to do to, again, have um, a fund to offset this to limit the budgetary impact that a major retirement may have or a separation may have on the town, that the money is set aside in the trust fund and the board typically as agents can uh, vote to withdraw that money um, that was previously appropriated and set aside um, to limit future budgetary impacts. So kind of pay now so you don't have to, you can stabilize the tax rate as you move forward. Thank you, Scott. On page number 21, and we're, we're getting through this, pardon me, but I, I think this is uh, the most important document that uh, we review every year, uh, right up there with the budget. Uh, would you please explain as a matter of um, capital assets, uh, the depreciation schedule for years, um, and your thresholds for um, for values, mm -hmm. um, values on the top, and then uh, that depreciation schedule and the implications uh, for that hundred million essentially, and what that looks like for uh, an expenditure for leadership and citizens and taxpayers. Sure. Um, basically, the the town has a policy, and um, it sets a, a threshold or a criteria. It names essentially in accordance with GASB 34 what you consider a capital asset and. Um, all land is considered a capital asset. Buildings um, or improvements in excess of $10,000. Machinery and equipment have a $5,000 threshold. Uh, heavy equipment is $25,000. Vehicles are $10,000. Your infrastructure has $150,000. So that's the framework um, or the, the template criteria that the finance office is using to identify what is considered a current year expense versus a capital item that we're throwing on our asset listing. Um, again, if you were to look at your capital asset listing versus an asset listing for insurance, there might be more things on insurance, but these are the major the major items. Um, the depreciation range down below, um, those are kind of a useful lifespan. So buildings and improvements, they range between 10 years and 50 years, depending on management's estimate of the useful life of that building. Um, Machinery and equipment obviously is much lower, three to 25, in infrastructure 25 to 50. So basically, there's significant capital outlays. There are significant, ju there's significant judgment involved in trying to determine what the useful life is. But the whole, the whole goal is, is, is to match the useful life with the economic value of the asset so that you're, you're taking a, it's a straight line depreciation. So you take the same amount each year, but you're, you're trying to time that, um, 
that useful life with the actual economic reality or economic life of that asset and taking that expense each year. Got it, Scott. And, and um, it's, it's fair to say that if you've started out with $100 million, whether you pay it, uh, that, that expense that you identify, whether you replace it, repair it, uh, rebuild it, get a new one, uh, that adds up. And if you don't do anything, eventually you get hit with that bill when it crumbles or like our pipes out here, they're no good anymore or a wastewater treatment plant. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's 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 this concept here and then there's your, your capital planning that if you have a 100-year-old sewer system, um, you're going to need to either... Uh, budget for a major repair uh, that's going to sustain the system over a number of years or you're going to fix it as it breaks and maybe some years you win some years you lose but there's going to be a cost of maintaining infrastructure regardless great uh thank you scott and we've got different uh, fund balance classifications um could you just briefly explain those please on page sure. number 22. Yeah. um <clears throat> non-spendable um again mainly are prepaid um, items, inventory items. Um, restricted are amounts that are restricted from an external source. Maybe it's a grant or a contribution that comes with some strings attached. Um, that money is restricted. Committed is something that has been restricted by an act of the governing body by um, an annual meeting, say there's a special warrant article um, that's appropriating money for a specific purpose. That balance would be committed until either expended or, or lapsed. Um, assigned is something that has been designated by management as um, a use of fund balance. Typically, this is most significantly your encumbrances, some other items, but these are items that don't necessarily have the, the formal governing body level of restriction, but have been identified as not available or unassigned. And then your unassigned is what's, what's left over and truly free and available to, to spend or to appropriate towards reducing taxes in the next year. Great. Thank you, Scott. And I, I don't look for an answer, but it, it conceptually, I know that you have a contract for services with the town. We've got uh, these extraordinary uh, depreciation items. We've got these uh, um, essentially unfunded liabilities to the state for uh, uh, 34, Gatsby 34. Um, we've got that unassigned fund balance. We've got uh, exigent uh, infrastructure needs that are coming up for Warren articles. And I would be interested um, in uh, uh, your opinions on um, what a priority Priorities, what those uh, um, bond amounts look like uh, in that kind of service for the town. And I, and I don't speak for, for the board, um, but I think there's a, a value added to, for example, we, we voted here a couple of weeks ago on the um, uh, unassigned fund balance. We, we, we rolled over, if you will, $600,000. And uh, if we could get uh, a more professional uh, uh, input onto that, I think that's instructive uh, from somebody that's in the science of finance. Uh, and we don't get that. And uh, the year before was one million, I think, in this report. It was one million and change. Then we go to 600, and uh, we just kind of will split the difference. We did that. Um, I stand by that, but I, I think we can get a better professional uh, recommendation from you that, that backs up the science of finances. And I don't need an answer for that, but uh, um, I think that's an important consideration. Pardon me while I just review as I, as I push through this. Um, page number 27, uh, allowance for uncollectibles. We are looking at uh, $0.4 million. Can you explain the uh, uh, nitty-gritty on that, if you will? That is uh, 8000 bucks a week that we're not collecting. Um, what's the deal? You're smiling. No, uh, yes. Yeah, so that that is an estimate. I just want to take a look here at, sure. at the fund. Um, Again, I'm, I, I don't have the detail in front of me, but I believe the, the majority of that is going to be related to your emergency medical fund. Got it. Um, and amounts that have not been collected for ambulance services. Um, this is something that hits a community like Hampton particularly hard uh, because of everything, all the recreation that you have going on and the proximity of the beach that it places a strain on your uh, medical response. And these are essentially... Um, amounts that would need to be collected, but um, 
the ambulance services typically have poor collection rates across the board. Sure. Um, so this is a, a net amount or an estimate of, of uh, probably some older receivables that the town's having trouble collecting. Got it. And, and again, I would point to the Beach, and if we're running 20, 25 points of uh, percentage for service on that on 400 grand, that's $80,000, which is another unreimbursed expense um, at the state level, and I think that's uh, hugely problematic. Um, page 29, our uh, long-term bonds, again, we've got uh, uh, a substantial amount of warrants coming up this year. I'd be looking for uh, an evaluation on that, um, perhaps if the board would agree, and you uh, enlarge your scope of services and uh, get with finance and the town manager um, to uh, look at that. We've got um, maturity dates going out to t uh, 2034, um, and it just gives us a better management tool. We're running the first responder services, uh, we're responsive to citizens, myriad operations, and we get that scientific interpretation on designated fund balance, uh, our uh, depreciation, and then these bond schedules and what's coming off. And it's, sometimes it's hard, uh, I know it's hard for me, and I study it, um, to, to put all that math together and evaluate uh, future needs. Uh, and, and some that are, are today crumbling, and they, uh, they're hugely problematic. Um, interest uh, on page 30, it's uh, 4.3 million dollars on our on our bonds. Correct. Um, any solution to that? Uh, I know the interest rates are low; it's a good deal, but uh, uh, another expensive doing business. Um, any solutions on that? Any comments? Uh, again, it's looking at the totality of it. Um, some communities heavily fund trust funds to limit the amount of borrowing, limit the interest expense. It requires kind of an annual appropriation to to cover some of these needs so you can take the money from yourself. Um, but again, it has a short run impact of, if you're gonna put $500,000 into some type of capital improvement fund, that goes to the taxpayers that year and they're gonna have to pay for that in their tax bill versus waiting until you need to bond. But again, you're gonna pay that with, with interest. Um, Rates are low right now. They haven't always been low. Um, you know, there have been some refundings and refinancings that um, on bonds that are eligible to take advantage of the lower interest rates. But um, again, the, I guess the the conceptual solution to that is the more you put away in a in a capital reserve expendable trust type situation. It allows you to, you know, potentially reduce the amount you have to borrow going forward. But either way, money needs to be appropriated to, to pay for it. Um, obviously, if you go the bond route, you're going to be appropriating interest in principal. So there's going to be a cost to borrowing. Got it. Thank you, Scott. Page 31. Again, back to that. Uh that uh, great benefit we offer um, employees of the town. Um, at December 31, 2016, there's a $23.5 million liability for pensions. And I know there's a, a wiggle room in that based on, they're, they're assuming a 7.25, I think that's too high. However, there is uh, a significant shortage in that fund. And I would say that uh, for the year ended 2016, uh, the town recognized the pension expense, and it's pretty. It's going to be pretty much around <coughs> of three million dollars, and that is over 10 percent of our operating budget. Right, and, and 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 that's just a point to bring up with all of this too, as opposed to your bonds where there's an amortization schedule or repayment amount. Um, the net pension doesn't work like that. You have to your current rates that you're paying now for your police, your firefighter, your regular employees, those are both paying the expected benefits of your current employees, and there's a percentage of that rate that is designed to pay down this liability over time. Got it. That's why that number is, is so high. Got it, got it, understand completely. Uh, page number 33, uh, another $4.2 million in OPEB. Explain the uh, reality on the ground for that, please. Sure, and um, this is, other post-employment benefits. So this is essentially the cost of um, having employee, retired employees in your actuarial pool for health insurance. Theory being that even if you don't provide an explicit benefit where the town pays a portion of your benefits for a number of years, that everyone's rate is higher because you have retired individuals who are higher utilizers of health care. Um, therefore driving your, your costs up. The way the standard is now, what that is is they report it net. So that 4.2 million is the, is the accrual amount, if you will. But they say, 
we're going to give you credit for the contributions that you pay each year and we're going to project a liability based upon the net amount that's flipping over next year and you're going to get the bigger number um, the rules have changed so it's not going to be that number but it's the direction that things are heading and, and that disclosure is heading that these are going to be unfunded liabilities and, and again the OPEB, the net pension liability, it's not like your compensated absences where you're writing a check for someone or you have the ability to set aside money. There's no funding requirement for it other than you're, you're kind of paying through rates for all this stuff, but it is a large component of your balance sheet going forward. Got it. Uh, page number 42. Uh, again, when I get back to the state, we've got uh, uh, intergovernmental revenues, <clears throat> if you will, uh, and specifically the state, the meals and rooms <clears throat> revenue. Uh, is about what we get from our own trust funds. Uh, there's probably one restaurant in town or one hospitality uh, association that would do the $0.7 million that we receive for the state. Just throwing that out there again about um, imbalances with the state. Uh, and then for a total of $1.3 million, um, and, and of note, uh, there were gentlemen from Portsmouth, there were gentlemen from Portsmouth in here last week, uh, just on two things from the MTBE uh, disbursements of funds, they received $0.4 million side of that. Uh, and so um, I would, uh, Mr. Welch is uh, doing the eyebrows. Uh, I agree with him. I don't think I need to uh, beat that horse anymore. Um, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I think that's an extraordinary, extraordinary document, and it is getting tighter and tighter all the time. Uh, I would uh, applaud finance and the finance director. Um, her leadership and Mr. Welch's leadership, and you guys do a great job. And I would be interested um, to, to begin a discussion about some other scopes of service in terms of uh, these extraordinary depreciation amounts. Uh, these extraordinary Warren articles are going to hit us in, in perhaps um, expanding your scope of services for a fee to give us some, some good advice on that. Sure, and I can, I can work with Christy to develop a set of agreed upon procedures. Wonderful. Uh, Scott, thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. I have, a, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Number one, on the pension liability yes. going on top of the bonds, mm -hmm. what does that do to our, our bond rating? Maybe you or Christy could. It, there, so what I can say, there's not a definite answer to that. Um, it's happened to everyone globally. Um, New Hampshire versus the peers, you have a relatively high percentage because our, our plan is one of the least funded probably the easiest way to put it um, but I do know just in my kind of talkings with some of the the people in the bond world that I believe that they look at the items separately um, net pension liability the, those companies understand what it is and they're more concerned with you know your traditional debt than than this liability although again certainly any liability would be a concern but I think everyone knows on the finance side, the difference between between the two, and it's not just that, you know, you went out and doubled your liabilities in one year. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other question is on, on the unfunded, uh, or the unassigned fund balance. Mm -hmm. The A lot of people assume that's a cash balance. That is not, it's right? It's not a cash balance. Right. Um, a lot of that can be tied up in receivables yeah. um, and things that are not in cash. And, and there is a cash balance on that report, but it's not your unassigned fund right. balance. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. For sure, was a cash balance. Yeah. Thank you, Christy. Oh yeah. Right. Approval of minutes. Uh, you got Jennifer Hale. Oh, Jennifer Hale. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sitting back, back there, so nice here. and quiet, like. Good evening. How are you all? Good. Um, I'm here tonight to give you a little bit of a project update on the Lockett Road sewer project as well as uh, talk about the contract that we have currently uh, with them. Over the last eight weeks, we have met weekly with JAMCO. Uh, we have one of our staff working the uh, 9 to 6 a.m. shift. Observing out there, our engineers Wright Pierce have been out there full time as well. Um, our police department has been out there every single night, everybody putting in uh, everything they can to complete the project. We have just run into uh, quite a few unforeseens, and that's the reason I'm here tonight, uh, to 
ex look at uh, receiving approval to extend the contract. Um, we don't want to finish rushing through this project. We are also very aware of people's patience uh, and the promise that I originally made, which was we would be off the road by November 17th, and we still want to meet that promise. Uh, but unfortunately, we could not make it all the way up Lafayette Road uh, with the time that we had. Uh, they've run into some unmarked duck banks. They've run into some water services that we didn't know was there. Uh, we've spent some time looking for sewers, you know, from 50, 60 years ago that one piece of paper said was here that was not here. And to do this right, everything has to be dug and tied back in. And we've been trying to pave every week. Uh, and that's where we're at. Um, I have nothing but good things to say about everybody that's doing this work. This is certainly not about any form of not doing their job or slacking or anything of that sort. Uh, this is strictly what happens in the construction business. And to do it right, we're going to need more time. So ultimately, I wanted to answer any questions you have. Uh, but also ask that we put their current contract on hold. Uh, the original contract is written such that they were given a notice of proceed date and then notice of uh, or substantial completion date. That substantial completion date we had always talked about November 17th and that we would be resuming in the spring uh, for final cleanup and paving uh, to May 26th. Right now we're looking to Again, end on the 17th, no more digging after that Thursday night. They'll spend the remaining three nights they have doing cleanup, uh, getting their equipment. Um, I hate to say this, but it's making sure we're prepped and cleared for snow. Um, we need to have all the piping off the roadway, all the equipment off the roadway. Um, and then they will pick up as soon as the director and the town manager uh, basically open the roads in the spring. Questions? So you're going to stop on the 17th or whatever, a few mm -hmm. days after that, and then as soon as the roads are good to go, you'll. how long do you think you'll have to continue into the... We think we're probably about four, 30 to 40 working days. Um, these days get complicated by rain. Uh, this past period, they've had five rain days. The next two weeks that we're looking at, if we look at the weather, there could be a potential of another four. So when you look at that, five nights is a full week. So um, they're telling me between 30 and 40 days. Okay. Well, I know I've been out there at night off and on seeing what they do. They're working real hard. I know they've run into a lot of old telephone vaults and, and other stuff out there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I want to see it done right. I don't want to see us hurry through it to try to get it done just to get it done. I want to see them get it done right. And if we need to... We need to hold it off into the it, it, this fall and put it off till spring. I don't see a problem with that. I want to see it done right. Rick, so are you saying the seventeenth, or did I hear you say three days after the seventeenth? So the last day of digging, so night and trench work will be the Thursday, which is the seventeenth, which goes into Friday morning, with the same the way they've been doing it. They finish their paving for that Friday morning. The following days that they'd be allowed to work would be the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, not the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And that would be for getting their fence down out of the municipal parking lot, cleaning up their piles, uh, the sweeping, the clear up, uh, basically get their stuff moved. To um, the spring. To the spring. Demobilization. Mm -hmm. So it's basically three days more work after the 17th. It is, and it may not take them all three days, but that's sort of the lines we've been drawing as far as how to present it and say, okay, what is going to work for you? Thank you. Bill? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm, I'm probably wrong about this, but we were told that this project would be done and, and index would be um, mid to the end of November initially, correct? Correct. And so contractually was uh, that time uh, built into the contract? Yeah, there is, yes, there's 103 days built into the contract. Okay, and have they exceeded the 103 days? No, we're asking to suspend it, that's why. To suspend it. All right, I'm, I 
Yeah, I think I made it confusing. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's me. I'm just having a hard problem, a hard time with the visa. So they're digging holes, they're putting in pipe. I know you run into stuff, but it's it's a fairly simple practice. Um, this construction goes. It was 103 days. They bid it. They said they were going to be done. We were told, business owners were told that they were going to be done. Some of these businesses are getting killed on Route 1 by this. Um, and now we're going to shut it down, and now there's another 30 or 40 more days. Did I hear that? The 30 or 40 days, including what they originally would be doing in the spring, which would be their cleanup and their paving. And so how, mu how much more of this interruption of services on, on Route 1? You're probably looking at a good... 30 working days, 30, 30. They're selling me between 30 and 40, so I'm using 35. That's it. I, I just. That's a month. I just, I just have a problem with that. Um, uh, and have they not been working during the when it rains? Uh, they do not work when it is pouring. And here's, I just want to expand on that to complete understand. Right now, they're 14. They started this project 14 feet deep uh, into the ground. Uh, that's how deep our structures are out on Lafayette Road at the end part. You put these trench boxes in there, the wet conditions do create an unsafe. So they have been working, but they can't do the deepest part. They'll tie services. <coughs> okay. they'll, they'll, they have two crews out there. So we are running two crews, a main crew and a service I've been down crew. there in the middle of the night watching it. And, and I would just say um, I'm, I'm concerned about what I'm hearing. Uh, we're not living up to contract, not <coughs> us, but uh, there, there are performance contracts in, in many uh, construction jobs. There are performance uh, bonds, and if you don't make those uh, performance metrics, your bond gets pulled. There's stuff going on in Portsmouth with bridges, and uh, there's places throughout the state where, and you're, you're familiar with this, you don't get the job done, you start suffering penalties. Um, and right now, businesses in town are suffering uh, hugely. And uh, I'm no uh, uh, mining and drilling and blasting guy, but I did spend four years uh, working construction and working under the Atlantic Ocean drilling and blasting and, and setting rail. Uh, and there's been a couple of days this fall where I, I could see that you wouldn't uh, work, but uh, no more than a couple of days. And, and weather has not been a consideration. Uh, and if people aren't working there, uh, that's what some pumps are for. That's what hard <coughs> are for. That's what those uh, um, reinforced steel barriers are. And uh, I have a, a large degree of dissatisfaction with what I'm hearing and uh, in response to, number one, what they bid. Number two is um, uh, what business owners are suffering through. So um, I, don't, I don't know what you do, but I'd like uh, more detail um, on it. And uh, I don't know if it takes a decision or what, but I'm not satisfied at all with what I'm hearing tonight, and it's the first time I've heard it. And I, I, I can't even imagine what's going on. I do know some of the business owners there. Uh, they're getting killed. Um, and now we've got people not living up to a contract. Uh, and um, there's going to be more economic suffering. So um, said my piece, I can, I can go on and on, but I'm, I'm not very happy with what I'm hearing. So if, if they have the three extra days in the fall, right, it will be a, a, a skim coat on there? No. The, no. The, pet, the trenches will all be paved. <coughs> so they will be paved as the way you see them coming up the roadway now, where they are flush with the roadway. and. They sit, and they sit for a year because they will settle. So if we put the pavement on top of it, what we're trying to avoid, and that's why we're waiting to spring to do any sort of final paving as well as look at to what gets approved as we move through the uh, future warm project, projects in, in what we do here out in Lafayette. Right? And was that built into the original that it would be in the spring that the... That the paving, that we would wait and see what happened after March vote to determine what was going to be the final treatment okay. of Lafayette Road this spring. So after the three extra days, it'll be fairly smooth, fairly... It will be trenches. I do not want to mislead anybody. So the idea is that they are laid as flat and level as they get rolled each night, each Friday, Thursday night, Friday morning. And what's your recommendation? Do you have a recommendation? My recommendation right now, because I have been watching and I follow them and we have our weekly meetings, and as far as the detail, I'd be happy to send this all along to you in one of the, the summer reports. But I have a list of all the nights and days that they've encountered issues, all the days that were rain delays uh, and what their delay of workers. My recommendation is that we put the contract on hold for substantial completion 
allowed to pick up when the town manager and the director open the road in the spring and provide them the 35 extra days to complete the contract. From a, from a town manager's point of view? They've had, <clears throat> unfortunately, a, a number of delays <clears throat> that uh, were not their fault. That's, that's part of the problem. Um, they had, I think last week, they had a duck line that they encountered as they were digging through the roadway. Uh, there was no record of that duck line. We didn't know whether it was live or whether it was dead, <coughs> whether it contained high voltage electricity or what. Uh, after they, it took them several hours to uh, to get the uh, the different companies out here to look at it. it. Turns out to be a dead telephone duck line, one that they never removed, one that was never marked, and apparently didn't even belong in the roadway because there was no permit for it, as far as we can find out. But that tied them up for several hours. You just can't go tearing up something that's concrete line for a duck line. Uh, we've had a couple of instances like that, and, and unfortunately, um, you know, I found one by accident the other day when I was reading a set of planning board minutes, uh, which apparently uh, did hold us up a little bit, but um, when a building was being built out there in that section of the roadway, there was apparently a brook that came down through that, that particular piece of property, and, and as a part of the <coughs> operation to... Uh, approve the building that was being built they uh, they connected the uh, the brook into uh, the drainage system on the other side of the road but there were no plans which is done by the seat of the pants uh, unfortunately uh, that those sorts of things hold you up because you don't expect to find them they're just not there they're not marked uh, so you end up either digging through them or you encounter them and don't break them and have to find out where it goes so there's a lot of problems there that we did not anticipate um, not that we didn't try to anticipate, but we can, we did not. So uh, every one of those problems means we have to slow down the construction to find out what comes next and to make sure that we're doing the right thing and not the wrong thing. Okay. I'll make a motion that we go along with the uh, deputy director's the suggestion of, of extending it and putting the contract on hold. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Thank, Thank you very much. much. <clears throat> Can I just read this before we lose any? I didn't see it before. It's an announcement. Okay, I'm before sorry. We lose any more people? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it doesn't say where it came from, but it's there are free boots and jackets for those in need. Free winter boots and jackets for men, women, and children of all shapes and sizes are available for those in need. The boots and coats will be given out beginning Tuesday, December 12th at 10.30 a.m. to 12 noon at Miraculous Metal Church at the St. Vincent de Paul Building, 289 Lafayette Road, White House at the back parking lot on the right. The event is sponsored by the St. Vincent de Paul uh, Society, and the number is 929-4427. Again, St. Vincent to Paul Society, 929-4427. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, approval of minutes, October 23rd, 2017. So moved. Second. All in favor? <coughs> Abstain? One abstention, Rusty. Uh, town manager's report, please. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, the State Department of Re Natural and Cultural Resources, the Division of Parks and Recreation, is hosting a community meeting this Thursday, November 9th, from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the Seashell Oceanfront Pavilion to discuss the 2017 season and the coming winter operations of the seacoast. It's open to the general public. Please go. Voice your opinions if you have any, or, or make, your, make your observations if you have any. 2017 leaf pickup begins next Monday, November 13th, 2017. Please be sure that your leaves are packed in biodegradable paper bags or loosely packed in large plastic containers that can easily be dumped. No brush, sticks, or wood. Please check the DPW website for further information. On November 15th, starting at 1 p.m., there will be no on-street parking from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. on any street in the town of Hampton. That's starting November 15th. 
petitions to amend the zoning ordinance will be accepted at the selectman's office starting next Monday, November 13th, until the close of business on December 13th. Petition warrant articles for any subject other than zoning may be submitted to the Board of Selectmen up until January 9th, 2018, and petition warrant articles for certain requests for bonding must be submitted by the close of business on January 5th, 2018 by statute. And I believe that the chairman announced this last week, but I'm going to announce it again. We have a tax rate for 2017. It is $16.37. The town is down to $6.32 from $6.41. The county is $1 up from $0.98. The school local is $6.85 up from $6.53. And the, the state school is $2.20 up from $2.16 which gives you a total rate of $16.37 per thousand. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Regina. Um, also, I just wanted to add uh, the town manager's office should have sent out, I believe, last week uh, anonymous letter to all our business and property owners in Hampton that pay rooms and meals tax. I've received a couple, and I believe Christina has also received some. I just want to let everyone know that although we know this will not be the most accurate way of determining what Hampton contributes to rooms and meals, it will be a closer number to what we currently get from the state of New Hampshire. So I hope that uh, all willing business and property owners will participate. Thank you. On that same venue, I know a couple of businesses at Gutterman were kind of questioning why they were put out there. So I tried to explain it to them, uh, and hopefully, again, they will put those out. Rick. Yeah, I would like to just point out that I got one, and I don't pay any of those taxes. So I supposed to? No. <laughs> Do you want to? No. <laughs> well, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to say that uh, on behalf of those that do take my nine percent um, tax on any uh, um, Rob Roy that I drink in town, um, uh, <laughs> please don't identify how much I'm spending on my. Uh, <laughs> Refreshments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a question. Sir, on the parking, November yes. 15th it starts. Charlie had come in here last week with an appointment and discussed the plowing in the town lots and an option. Was that option investigated? Well, the Public Works Director was just returned from vacation this morning. Okay. And he has been directed to investigate. Okay. So awesome. we will have an answer probably before the 15th? Yes. Okay. Yep. I expect so. We expect it. we'll have an answer next week. Okay, good. Thank you. Old business. Rick. Yeah, uh, so what has happened about, we did ask within two weeks uh, a, pl a plan to take down the uh, fence at the cemetery and oh, possibly yeah. put a new fence up. We've heard nothing. He didn't come back. Yeah. He was here. That's really dead was. He was? He was upset. Yeah, I think they told him that he didn't have to be here. So... We well, we had already passed the budget. He was supposed to come back before we voted on the budget last right. week and discuss with us. But he was supposed to come back with a, uh, a plan. An estimate. An yeah. estimate. An estimate. Yeah. Cost. So we need to find out what that is. I, I'm sure he has. If it. I may, Mr. Yeah. Chairman and, and, and Selectman Griffin, uh, there was a miscommunication that um, Sue Irwin wanted to speak with me uh, last Friday. And uh, she wants to speak to the town manager for my phone conversation with her um, today. So if you two reach out to each other, um, perhaps we can satisfy some of oh, these Oh, I things. had a message this afternoon that is no longer necessary for me to talk to her. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> so, well, she'll probably know the answer. I suspect she, she will, and we'll fence. find out. So you can talk about something else. We will find out for you. Okay. <laughs> All right, I believe it's under old business, I'm not sure. The Hampton Beach Area Commission, we said that we were going to take that up. It wasn't on the agenda, but we said we were going to take it up tonight, and that was well announced. Yep. Uh, we also, um, we had, as far as I know, three names, three people submitted names. I've heard three. Three, one being Mary Louise uh, Wolseley, Jim O'Laughlin from the beach, and uh, Senator Nancy Stiles submitted their names for consideration. Right. All three have a lot of experience in Hampton. All three, uh, Jim O'Laughlin was on the budget committee. He's a beach resident, lives down there. So all three have experience <laughs> and done things. And did anybody want to discuss anything before anybody makes a nomination or anything? 
Yeah, I do. I, okay. I, and and it, it wasn't on the agenda tonight. Um, and I, I do have a detailed presentation. Happy to make it. If you do an appointment this uh, this evening, I won't vote for it. Uh, I am uh, in the favor after a detailed review of the law, after the uh, powers and duties review of the commission, after a, a detailed review of the Hampton Beach Master Plan, which is a 50-year-old document. Uh, um, I, I have major, major problems and concerns that are founded in fact uh, in accordance with those documents. And uh, I am in the position that I would like to, uh, it's not on the agenda, uh, it's been well announced that I do want to do a presentation for that. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to do that next week. Mr. Nyan is still the commissioner. Uh, and he is still on the board. Uh, he is not done. There's nothing that uh, requires that we uh, jump to this right now, and I would respectfully request that it be formally noticed on the agenda. And having said what I've had to say, uh, it gives those in the community to advocate differently than uh, um, my position. I think it's fair to them. I think we can go one more week. Okay. You know, I think we should be prepared to do it next week after Phil makes okay. his presentation. My, my apologies. Uh, it was not on the agenda because I wasn't in town on Friday, and I didn't I saw the agenda on Thursday, and I thought that Phil had been prepared to do it tonight. So if the thought is to hold off a week, it's fine. It yes. will work out fine for the Hampton Area Commission. Okay, and we'll do it as an appointment, Phil? Just, just whatever you say, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and we'll, we'll invite... Uh, others to come in and speak at the same time. Absolutely. I think that's fair to them. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. So that's next week. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Super. Anybody else have anything else under old business? I just want to actually bring up something that um, Noam, Noam Silberdick said earlier about the cable committee fund. Because I know there's a lot of money in there, but do we know of any plan to maybe update the system that maybe we're still working on? Well, one of the things they did was, obviously, when, when the school was here last year, last right. week, they talked about some of the plans that they have for their mm -hmm. for their new studio and stuff. But we've also asked uh, the cable committee is, is working on a five-year plan to find out they can bring this studio up. A lot of the equipment we have here is originally when they purchased it. Uh, it's been held with, together with bailing wire and bubble gum. Uh, and they've done a great job at it, but there's some thoughts to bringing up some new technology, bringing up some more modern cameras. They have a new gentleman that's on the committee now that has a lot of history in uh, how to work this, work these uh, uh, studios out. So I'd like to wait and see what they have to bring back. I know they're working on it diligently to bring that to us to see what there is for costs, but to whether it's digitize it or however it is, whatever they need to get it to the next level. And with better sound, you know, we've had sound problems over the past. They have a five year, they're working on a five year plan now, and I'd like to wait to see that comes back. How long is it going to be before it comes back? Uh, I'll have to ask. Yeah, because there's a lot of interest in this particular subject. Okay. There's a lot of talk going on. Um, and I'm not saying I feel one way or the other. I would like to hear what they have to say also. But um, I think that this, it's going to fit in very. Uh, it's going to be important when the talk about the Warren articles mm -hmm. come along. So we'll need to have all the information we can have by that time. Right. And pe people should go and look at other towns' uh, cable TV stations, their local cable Absolutely. TV stations. A lot of them are very, very more, uh, much more advanced than we are here. The guys have done a super job with what they have. A super job what they have but the cable franchise fee supposedly goes to the cable station and that's what they're working on now of upgrading us to, to match these other towns or if that's not what the people want then that, that that's a decision too but and the school also when they finish building the school will be coming back probably for more money yes. on their end on because they'll be expanding their operation I'd like to know if there's a definitive answer if you know, it was done in the past that it was used to offset the tax base. Now, is I know that because we've spent so much time, many so through the years, I've spent a lot of time looking and talking to the different lawyers that represent us with uh, the contracts with the cable uh, company. Um, and is there anything that prevents us from using it as 
something to offset part of it to offset the taxes. Well, there was a question brought up by certain individuals in the community that the money is contributed by everybody who, who subscribes to the TV system, and the money should be used for that purpose as opposed to subsidizing property taxes. Mm -hmm. And that apparently carried the day at town meeting, and the town meeting voted to, in fact, can, to take all the funds and put them towards the cable TV system. Before that, uh, I believe it, we, we, a percentage, a substantial percentage, was dedicated to reducing property taxes. Wasn't it 64? I think it was 60, 40 percent. Yes, yeah. that's how I remember it. Yeah. But, but then my feeling is you had a, you had a certain percentage in town who subscribed to cable TV paying to reduce everybody's taxes. Mm -hmm. And was that, a, was that a fair? That was part of the complaint. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's, I mean, it's, it's open for discussion. I would like to know if there's any e legal status well, we could, of we, how the government looks at it. We can certainly find what out. What are allowed to do with Just that so was listening. I was listening, yeah. yeah. Well, this is what, what we're doing is uh, we have uh, the new, new uh, gentleman, Rick, and he has extensive experience in TV, working for NASA for the last uh, 12 or so years, running their department, which is pretty vast. Uh, and we're, he's, we're working on a, a plan to upgrade the whole thing. We've been over to Bedford. We've been to Northampton. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, more vendors come in. So now I have three vendors, which is, and um, it's just it's just taking time. I mean, we don't have, we never did get a full uh, part-time guy. So, you know, we do it as we can. I work full-time. Well, full -time. that could be part of your plan if that really fits well, into yeah, it. Well, yeah, we just can't find anybody. Nobody yeah. wants, I guess everybody's busy. Can't find anybody that wants to work part time, twenty you know, twenty hours a week. So, do you think hour. you're going to have any um, uh, estimates by the time the I warrant would, article derby starts? Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. He's working hard on it. It's basically Rick doing it because he's, he's he's he knows so much more than I ever did on it. So, and we're very fortunate because I'd be lost without him. To tell you the truth, and he's and he's doing it like like. He was saying it's a five-year plan, but we're trying to do a studio that will be good for 10 years. So you'll just be, it'll be all new. It'll be easy to operate for anybody to come in, can be easily trained. And we'll be good for 10 years, so all you have to do is maintenance. And after that, what you want to do with all the money, it's, it's up to you. But if you want to cut it now, I mean, if they cut it now, I mean, that goes down the drain. We're back to where we are now. And, you know, if we go back to the 40%, trying to feed this and the school it just can't be done because mm -hmm. the school is going to want a studio over there mm -hmm. and if you want that that's mm -hmm. if that's what the town wants and that's what the people want that's fine but it's well, just it's just you know the uh but you know, just, we're going to have to look at it well i know what people you know well where, where's all this we have all this money spent well i'm just not gonna i i can't just spend the money to spend it you know just to say just blow money i mean we're trying to it's not going to be a cheap cheap uh, upgrade you know, it's going to be all high def. Now, granted, we won't put out high def. We will stream high def, and you can go to YouTube and, and, and stuff like that and watch in high def. But you'll get a much better picture. Yeah. And we'll eliminate all the uh, ins and outs. I mean, Rick has shown me where, why our, our, uh, our, our picture is not as good as a lot of, you know, even people who are still, we're digital. But we keep, we go from this to this back up to here to here to here and then we go out whereas other comp well, other like bedford goes in and out so they don't have all this degradation of their uh, their picture being degraded every time it uh gets uh downgraded and upgraded or whatever so i mean we just i, I we're going as fast as we can you yeah. know and, and it's and he's doing as much as he can to get all the facts and figures and do it right mm -hmm. you know but he's got he's also used to you know NASA figures, so he's got to go down to you know town figures, you know small town figures. So he's he's working it out and and going in, you know going to see other studios. Bedford's probably the one of the better ones in the state, and uh, you know and then there's Concord and stuff, and we plan on going to see their their operation, get ideas from them. So, but uh, we're going to try to get it before the uh, all the Warren articles and stuff. Well, well, after watching it for the last 12 years, I will tell you know, be, it's really changed a lot, 
yeah. and the whole thing has been in transition the whole time. Yeah. Well, and, we've never had uh, money. I mean, this is like a when we got that month, that was just like wow. We went from okay, we'll have enough to sustain what we're doing to 100 percent. So we're like we're caught off guard with that. So. So and and like again, not having a part-time person—that's what that person would be doing. Was doing all this research, and so now we have people doing it in the evenings and such. So well, we're very fortunate to have you, your brother, all the other guys that are back there. There's a lot of them. Yeah, and we appreciate it. Well, we're losing more and more, so we're getting no, down there. Yeah. So that might be something that we have to address. We do have also. to address that too. There's a lot we that have to address. Be part of the final, the a better plan. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Your ears were burning, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Any other old business? Yes, sir. I have some, Mr. Chairman. Um, on Wednesday, there will be a uh, uh, Governor's Council Seacoast uh, Cancer Investigation uh, meeting uh, regarding Seacoast Cancer Cluster, and uh, I will prepare some uh, motions for that uh, um, commission. I have uh, forwarded the email to um, our representatives, our local representatives for that, and uh, we'll make those motions uh, based on, on my uh, output and input uh, during that, uh, that public hearing you held, Mr. Chairman. And then I'll be back to the board on that uh, for motions uh, for the town of Hampton through its selectmen to uh, reinforce our, uh, our position on that and see uh, where that goes. Secondly is uh, uh, Wednesday evening, Mr. Welch, there's a hearing when and where uh, regarding this with the EPA in Northampton? There is a meeting uh, with the Environmental Protection Agency to talk about uh, PFCs and, and other good things that uh, supposedly are being sent our way by. And that'll be in Northampton? Donor. There's going to be in Northampton, I believe, is at 7 o'clock. I, I, I believe you're right. So I wanted to uh, highlight that. I'll be in attendance at that, as will Representative Messner. Um, at the Northampton Town Hall, right? Yes, yes, sir. I believe that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And then. Um, I wanted to discuss, and I, and, I, and I haven't, Mr. Chairman, I had the opportunity, I was, I was out a couple of weeks ago, um, and it was my understanding that there was a, uh, a motion and a vote about hiring new employees. And I understand that we've got an elected uh, body of our employment body uh, through the town clerk, and I understand those, those positions would rightfully go to a, uh, a town warrant. But uh, could we uh, um, rediscuss that notion that uh, it's, it's my understanding that any new employees, and, and I hope I'm wrong on this, um, in the town of Hampton have to be put on, a, uh, on the town warrant, is that correct? Is that incorrect? Full-time yeah. employees. Full-time. Okay. okay. And, and I, would, I would just say this um, on that, and I think... You want to make a motion to revisit that? Because yeah, it's yeah, well, been I, 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 I would, well, I would like to have this discussion, because I, I, and then I'll make my motion um, about it, because I wasn't here. And I think that's a substantial uh, diminution and uh, uh, restriction of uh, the selectman's statutory authority to uh, lead in the prudential and execution of the prudential affairs under the RSA. I'm on the New Hampshire Municipal Association website right now, and there are tort cases that, that uh, selectmen can actually do that, and I think that that does that. And whether we're here for four more months or six more years or ten more years, uh, it is a, a very restrictive uh, provision. And I think the appropriate way for that to go, I think the cart before, is before the horse. If, if the townspeople have so little confidence in a board, um, that in some exigent manner or an emergency management issue and a police issue that happens and we have to wait for 15 months um, or 12 months or 14 months to hire somebody on a $26 million corporation. We just heard uh, the uh, explanation of the audit. It's, it's a huge corporation. I think that hamstrings the people and the people are in charge of this town. We work for the people. We work for the citizens, not the taxpayers. Taxpayers for sure, but for the citizens. Uh, they empower us at the polls and when they vote for us to make these decisions. And they have our confidence, or they vote us out, or we leave. But I think it's a, uh, a restriction uh, of our statutory authority. I think we act in the best interests of the town. Uh, there, are, there are employment uh, executions and decisions we've made uh, as a board together. 
in bringing somebody up when we had a sudden onset and a sudden death in, in retweaks a, p a position that I think has been fabulous for this town. And we would not be able to do that. And sometimes there's some great talent that moves up the ranks uh, through our departments and um, they go elsewhere and they're going to be gone forever and they're never going to come back. Um, so I, I do think it is a restriction. Uh, there's precedent uh, in the New Hampshire Municipal Association. And I think if uh, the townspeople want to put that as a Warren article, then they have every right to do that. And that, that should be a Warren article put out by a petition. But for us to uh, unilaterally uh, restrict that, I think, is in violation of the spirit of the ordinance and the confidence that people have. So I don't know the exact motion um, that, that it would be, but I would say that um, we certainly don't have to go uh, uh, through a warrant to hire one person in a $26 million corporation. And if someone is here that that made that motion or someone that, 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 that wants to uh, make that motion that participated in that, that's fine. I'll defer to that. If not, I will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say, I thought we made a motion that all new positions. New positions. New positions. Not new hires. Not, new yeah, positions. not new, not new all full-time employees. New yeah. positions. Any new position would go on the Warren article. And I would like to uh, bring up the, uh, how, what happens, um, <coughs> for instance, let's use uh, the town clerk. Uh, if she, if uh, she, if we put it in the budget and then the budget fails, then she gets nothing. And in the past, and I'm not blaming her, but this is how other people have done it: they hedge their bets and then they do their own Warren article. Besides, okay. so you know, I don't. If we're gonna, if that's the way it's gonna be, I would just assume. You know, I don't know. There's. I think it needs to be one way or the other. The voters need to have a say, and they're put in, in put into double, double jeopardy. Uh, as you know, is the budget going to fail because of that? Um, and I see how it works, and I wish everyone the best. And I, but we have to, you know, that's. A problem that's been faced over and over again, and I guess it's going to remain that way by the sound of it. And if I could just have one more comment, and that'll be all, Mr. Chairman. Is uh, I won't make any motion tonight, but I did want to revisit it, and I think uh, an example is uh, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, we would not have been able to do that. We created a new position as assistant person or assistant town manager and personal personnel director. Uh, and we've got tremendous bang for our buck in terms of a, uh, a lifelong tenured uh, emergency response, first responder, chief of police for the town of Hampton, uh, a labor expert, a negotiations expert, human resource expert, uh, second command. If anything, God forbid, ever happens to a leadership here, he can step in in a moment's notice. We could not have done that, um, and he would be elsewhere. So I won't make any motion tonight, but it's for consideration. We might come up again. And thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, any other old business? All right, draft warrant articles. When do we have to have these done by? The Budget Committee starting the budget Thursday? I believe the last day to submit. Police and Fire Thursday. Yes, they are. The police and Fire this Thursday. Okay. Uh, the last day to submit warrant articles, I believe, is January 9th. Okay. So we have to have them completed by then. Okay. I'm assuming that you will receive, traditionally you do receive a number of draft uh, petition warrant articles, yeah. and those will just roll along into the into the warrant, as they always do, because they have to. Uh, the other warrant articles are things that <clears throat> have been brought up. They're in the long-range capital expenditures report. They're items submitted by various departments, uh, and the selectman's position is to ferret them out and determine whether or not they belong in the warrant, basically. I have a, well, I just had a comment. That had, has everybody had time to look and study the, the warrant articles that we've received? Probably not. I've not. I've gone through them, but I haven't. I've gone through them quickly, but I've not. Right. We could go through them quickly now just to have a few. Uh, I see one major glaring thing that I would like to talk about. All right. I mean, do we, do we want to hold off for a week? Oh. Well, I'd like to throw my idea out now. Okay. Uh, because it's one of the biggest ones on here. All right, here. go ahead. Um, well, I definitely will be against replacing the Church Street across the marsh. 
So I'm not going to be wanting to, uh, to vote for that. I would like to see uh, probably the same amount of money spent on the wastewater treatment center or a way to, to uh, I don't know if we need to start, you know, like a, a fund mm. and let the money build up or if there are specific things. But to put something on there that the people already have voted down, I think is a mistake. And I'd, I'd hate to see that to be the only thing that we're going to do about the wastewater treatment center uh, because I think that there's, I have felt right from the beginning, but it's just how I feel about it, um, that there are lots of things to be done there. I've heard about it for years. Oh, sure. It's no surprise to me. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see things done that the people haven't already voted against. Mm -hmm. And that's, I feel really strongly about it, so I just want to throw that out there. I, well, I'm sorry. While we're talking on that issue, and, and I don't necessarily disagree with you, Rick, but as we're moving forward, we have a lot of issues that are the same problem. Right. Sewer lines here, the sewer plant. Should we look at doing a major pro program and bond it all together to allow it to be put out over a few years instead of trying to pay for it all at once. Well, there's $41 million. That's why I say that we should be able to take some of that $37 million that the people already haven't voted against. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, we ought to yeah. do Those it. Those are the, so that's some bond the issues to put have. them all together. Yeah. Right. Regina? Are we going to, next week, is it, are mm -hmm. we going to have a schedule? Someone going to come in and talk to us about? Yes. We've asked the consulting engineers that produced the report to come in right. and brief you yeah. on the report. Uh, because we're concerned, too, that, in fact, there are things that need to be done there, and some of them are very urgent. Uh, and we're not opposed to scrapping everything dealing with sewers in here until you review that entire thing. Mm -hmm. Because I think you have to review it as a group. <laughs> and, and it may be that we have things within the sewer plant, and I believe we do, that are much more urgent than other things that may be out in the street that are working fine at the moment, even if they are in poor shape. Well, that's why I would like to look at that. And, you know, I know that at the Hampton Area Commission, John um, Nyan, he's trying to set up what the committee is going to look like, although he's not going to be there, so I really, I think that should really wait until the next person comes. Um, that, uh, you know, he wants to start beating the drums for this. Well, I'm not so sure it's going to be there. As far as I'm concerned, it shouldn't be there. And I think, you know, we have to discuss that about building up a, a fund or whatever else. Whichever way, I'm all for putting, I'd like to set aside dollars <coughs> for something. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I've got the uh, 3 November thing, and uh, um, I've looked at the initial offering. And uh, I mentioned it earlier tonight with, um, Scott from the uh, uh, auditing firm, and we looked at that depreciation mammoth that's that's crushing, and uh, it's never been reinvested, and now it's on your watch, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to the to the fun time, and uh, you're doing a great job on it, Mr. Chairman. But it it just needs to be like Rusty says, a, a much more professional, and not that we're not professional. It's just such a huge yep. monster to put our hands around, and that we have someone come in with Public Works. They sit with Scott. I, I think they have to plus up their contract, and we look at that more globally, and we incorporate that. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to uh, perform to the best for the for the citizens. So that that's what I'm looking for. Recommend, not recommend, and have 20. There's no tax impact. So you're nodding your head. You know what I'm talking about. Thank you. So you won't throw a monkey wrench in your, if we say we, we want to look at this more globally, listen to Price Pierce Wright, look at the whole thing. Yeah, I think we're not. Is we, that, we want you to look at the entire thing okay. and, and try to come down with a decision on how we should proceed. Uh, you're right, $41 million, that's including the interest. It's a pretty big nut to crack, no matter who you are or where you are. Uh, the problem we have is that we have certain things at the wastewater treatment plant that need to be done now. They're dangerous. They're dangerous to our employees. They're dangerous to the operation of the plant. We need to isolate those with professional expertise, and we need to look at what those costs are. And maybe we need to do a bond issue this year to address those particular issues. 
<clears throat> there are some things down there that can really, really hurt us. We need to start addressing those. And Rick's right. I think in 2007 when I came here, I made the observation that we had 40 or $50 million worth of work to do at the wastewater treatment plant. We haven't done any of it. So we need to get there from here. Well, the other boards have always, you know, back at that time, we were facing uh, all kinds of things. Terrible situations for the people, the taxpayers. People were losing oh, yeah. their homes. People were losing their jobs. Yep. So a lot of things were done, especially for that. But it was done then and put off with the idea that it was coming forward. And that's why I would like to see a comprehensive. Okay. Uh, we agree on that? Yeah. Yes, and, and I would just add this, and I know uh, that you, you and uh, Regina will work on this. You're the liaison to the Budget Committee, that we keep them informed of this and actually yeah, yeah. make that phone call or that email to the chair. I've already talked to the chair okay. today about this. Wonderful. And um, I want to say that I know a lot of people have gone through this and read, and it's really uh, it's informational. This stuff needs to get done. It's like been being kept talking about depreciation in the financials if you look at our total capital assets 97 million whatever it is 97 and a half 51 percent of our assets have been depreciated that means financially they're gone that and, and nothing's nothing's gone back this is a huge chunk of that so it's really something that we need to uh start looking at and we need to look at it like next week will be a good starting point so everyone can get on the same page what's the most important most detrimental right. and then maybe work on putting a bond together for that those certain items yep. i think will be the best thing absolutely any other new business uh i i had one thing um uh mr chairman uh i received uh uh a correspondence from a, a taxpayer. It is uh, from Ocean Gaming and uh, Millie's Tavern, the owners, and I've discussed this with Mr. Welch, but if we could have it as an agenda item next week, as Mr. Welch has informed me, it's an SB2 town, Kino, I believe, yeah. uh, has been enabled. They're looking for a definitive answer if there's any way to expedite that. I don't need an answer now. If we could put that as an old uh, uh, business item next week, and you specifically address that we have to wait until the... Uh, In fact, you can do it now. There is no... There, there, it's, there's there's no appropriation required. Right. It simply says that the towns must vote on it. It's an enabling act. You can't have it in your community unless the town votes on it. In the past, the town has always put those items on the ballot, and it's, in fact, it is a warrant article, and we prepared a warrant article for it in accordance with the statute. No cost to the town. It, it raises money for kindergartens is what it does, and that helps everybody in the state. So our recommendation was to put it on the warrant doesn't hurt a thing. If people don't want it, they vote no. It is a form of gambling, mm -hmm. okay, but it's a legal form of gambling in New Hampshire. Um, it's it's a very good idea, i got to tell you. I mean, people who want to gamble, they're going to gamble. Whether they gamble here or they go to Massachusetts or Maine or whatever. Uh, let them spend their money here, let them gamble here, and let them fund our school problems here. That's and, my thought. And so you're saying that there's, um, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that, that it's in concrete. There's no uh, early approval by the selectmen on this. It's got to go to town warrant. It's it, got to be voted it on. It has before. to by statute go to warrant. It has to by statute. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And Chairman. also, and, and I'm not making a comment one way or the other on this, yep. but even if you don't vote it in, you still get some of the money. Right. They oh, yeah. mentioned that on TV today. Yeah, it goes, to, it goes into a state. So even if a town says, no, I don't want Keno, like right. they still get yeah. Keno money. There, and there will be towns that will vote no and not yeah. have it, okay, yeah. for whatever reason they particularly yeah. choose. And there are, hopefully there's going to be enough towns that vote yes, so there is some money to distribute. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, one other item, and yeah. uh, since Rusty uh, uh, Selectman Bridal is uh, an integral part of the Chamber of Commerce, there was uh, an announcement, which is essentially public now, about um, that young man from Prescott Farms. Would you care to announce? Uh, his, no, I'm his, all set. He, yeah. I'll let him do that at his own time. Okay. Well, it, it is on the street, and I will say that um, um, uh, Doc Noel has uh, offered a resignation letter, uh, and so he won't be continuing on. He's been there for 17 years. Uh, he's an incredible businessman, an incredible uh, commitment to the Town, to the business community. He never interfered with uh, the Board of Selectmen. He stayed in his lane. He's a classic gentleman. Uh, and uh, I would move that we send a, a letter from the Board and executive leadership thanking him for his uh, past years. Thank you. Favor. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, he's done a wonderful job and he's always been the most cooperative person that Good we've man. dealt with here at the Board of Selectmen. 
Good man. Any other old business? Closing comments? Motion to adjourn 2054. Two CDs, Bill. All in favor? Oh, second. Uh, second. <laughs> All in favor? Those minor little things. So, Fred. Thank you, Channel.